Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. Yes, COVID finally hit my household last weekend. How bad was it? How did we manage that? Now I'm going to share a short story on how my family experienced that disease, and also reflect on what I've learned on this topic after being a health education channel YouTuber for a little bit more than two years now. But first, I would like to really thank all of your support and encouragement, especially since last summer when a lot of you discovered my channel. And I know there are tons of health channel on YouTube hosted by scientists and physicians with a lot more experience than I do. And I'm honored that you still find values in my channel in this ocean of information and willing to tolerate my accent. So my family's COVID experience began with my son feeling a little sick with a light fever after coming home from school on the Thursday before the Labor Day weekend. We let him do an antigen test, but I don't know if it was a sample collection error or something else. It showed a negative. My wife and I did not think too much of that and believed it might just be a common cold or other respiratory viruses. Now, my son was not vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccine, and we gave him children's Tylenol, acetaminophen, or paracetamol for my non-US viewers, as needed to lower his fever. My wife started to experience some cold-like symptoms late Friday, with a sore throat and feeling very tired the following day. My wife was vaccinated with Johnson and Johnson and one dose of the Moderna booster last December. By Saturday night, no one in the household was thinking about potentially having COVID, and we interacted normally. But after my wife developed a low fever on Sunday, I started to suspect that it may be more than just a cold, because adults don't usually have a fever with a common cold. So I gave her Tylenol and asked her to do an antigen test, which turned positive in just a few seconds. Meanwhile, my son's symptoms have shifted from the upper respiratory tract to the gut. He had episodes of diarrhea and low appetite. Though he slept a lot over that few days, he no longer had any fever and cold-like symptoms by Monday. My wife had a slight dry cough and started her diarrhea episode on Tuesday after the Labor Day holiday. So both of them had a very similar course of symptom changes. They were fully recovered by the time I prepared this video on Saturday, September 10th. Overall, even though my son was not vaccinated, I think he had fewer symptoms than my wife. In terms of the care during the week, besides taking Tylenol as needed, they kept hydrated with water and hot tea. My wife also drank some medicinal herbal tea our friend sent us from Taiwan. By this time, if you are still watching, you may wonder, where am I in the story? So, I was exposed to the virus for more than two days without knowledge, but I have been perfectly fine. I had no symptoms and did not test positive. If you remember my exposure episode from early June at a training conference in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is my second known exposure to the virus in three months. I haven't gotten any booster vaccine in 2022, and I have stopped taking my seasonal allergy medicines since July. However, I did do tons of yard projects in the summer, and I think my vitamin D level has been adequate throughout the summer season. And if you want to know my lifestyle or my family's lifestyle, I can tell you I don't usually eat fast food or highly processed food, and we rarely dine out. I don't follow any particular special diet, but I do focus on more dietary fiber and plant protein intake. And I try my best to swim for about 90 to 120 minutes every week. So maybe you're like me, you've been exposed to COVID more times than you can count, and yet somehow you never tested positive. 
You and I may share this question: Does exposure to the virus help our immunity, even if we don't get sick? First, we need to understand that our immune system only gets activated when it sees a certain level of infectious proteins or infectious parts of a virus, or so-called antigens. Multiple exposures that don't result in a detectable infection may still result in the body sensing enough viral particles to activate the immune system and boosting your defense against the virus. It is more possible, especially if you already have immune memory from prior infection or vaccination. But asymptomatic and non-positive exposure is not likely to boost immunity as much as a symptomatic disease, because the viral load in the body is much lower when a person doesn't feel sick. Now, am I worried about my son developing multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISC? I would not say the chance is zero. But multiple observational studies from Israel and Denmark and the U.S. have concluded that COVID infections with the Omicron variant have a lower rate and severity of MISC than Delta variant infection. For example, Israel researchers concluded that MISC incidents per 100,000 people younger than 18 years old were 54.5 during Alpha. 49.2 during Delta and 3.8 during Omicron, a much much lower rate. Denmark researchers reported a similar MISC rate of about 3.5 per 100,000 unvaccinated children under 18 years old. What about long COVID? Long COVID is a complicated topic by itself, and whether Omicron causes long COVID symptoms as often and as severe as previous variants is a heated area of study. First, long COVID symptoms can be grouped into three symptom cluster types. Number one being neurological symptoms, include brain fog, headache, depression, and fatigue. Respiratory symptoms include severe shortness of breath, palpitations, and chest pain. And systemic inflammatory and abdominal symptoms include muscle skeletal pain, anemia, and gastrointestinal disorders. Researchers from King's College London identified 56,003 UK adults who tested positive for COVID-19 from December 20, 2021 to March 9, 2022, aka the Omicron wave period, and 41,361 cases from June 1, 2021 to November 27, 2021, aka the Delta wave period. The average age was about 53 years old, and they defined long COVID as having new or ongoing symptoms four weeks or more after COVID-19 onset. They find that 2,501 or 4.5 percent of the Omicron patients and 4,469 or 10.8 percent of Delta patients experienced long COVID. Regardless of the timing of the vaccine, the odds of long COVID for Omicron patients were 24% to 50% less than for Delta patients. However, one major limitation of this study is that it did not assess long COVID in unvaccinated individuals. Now, there is definitely a lot more to learn about long COVID in the coming months and maybe even years. The study I just reviewed used a Zoe Health app to track patients' self-reported long COVID symptoms. Now, I need to emphasize that I'm not affiliated with them in any way. But if you would like to participate in their ongoing effort to understand long COVID, you may want to check that out. The website link is in the description box below. Coming back to the story, I'm not too worried about long COVID and MISC based on the study that I've seen and what I know about my family members' health. Now, certainly that doesn't apply to everyone that is watching this video. And we are also doing something to optimize our health. They sound easy, which is that my family values a lot on a balanced diet. 
and we are also very conscious about fat, sugar, and salt in our daily meals, and we regularly exercise. Now, believe me, it sounds easy, but it is not easy to do it consistently. We try our best. So, what about this new bivalent booster vaccine? Well, my wife and my son are certainly not considering a COVID vaccine for at least three months. Now, there is actually quite a lot of debate on how long a person should wait、uh, for a COVID vaccine after an infection. Now, we will talk about this topic in my next video. As for me, well, I have been exposed to the Omicron variant、uh, twice in three months. So I'm not in a rush at all, um. But unless my university mandates that, well, as much as I want to do YouTube full time and、uh, relay and explain health information to everyone, the ad revenue is just not enough to support even a single person at this point. To wrap up, I want to say that we are now living in a world with so much information poured on us. On a daily basis, oftentimes we hear the term misinformation and disinformation, and all depends on who's saying that message. And it is hard for people without a technical background to decipher the proper meaning. Now, I try to use as many published, reputable studies as possible to support my message in my videos. Sometimes you may not like what I say. You may disagree with me, you may unsub me, or give me a thumbs down. That's okay, because we need to hear different voices, especially when these voices matters to your health and health decision. That is all for this week. This video is certainly different, and thank you for all of you that stay until the end and watched everything. If you still find my video valuable to you. I hope to see you again next week. Now, my videos may not be the best; they may not be the first to cover a particular topic, but I hope they bring you a different perspective and a refreshing voice. Lastly, I know some of my long-term viewers just recently got COVID, and I hope all of you have a speedy recovery. Please take care. Bye.